Uh, my name is Jason Lynch. Uh, I'm here because I have undertaken a family history project. And I'm not quite sure, I, I'm sure I didn't realize what I was getting into when I started this because I thought it would be a pretty easy, straight thing, figuring out how my ancestors, and as I learned a whole bunch of other of my ancestors and a whole bunch of other families, came out to Connecticut uh, in 1633 to 1636. Uh, so uh, I set out to try and find the path, and uh, it's drawn a lot of interest, and I'll share that with you. Uh, question for you before I begin, because I'm not going to go through and show you pictures of every place along the way. I tried that up in Woodstock, and they were very, very pleasant. Uh, and I had a really big crowd at the Historical Society a year ago, and uh, I just said, well, PowerPoint is not the way to tell this story. So I want to ask you to... I've wound up going back to a lot of the places and doing video and editing and putting it up on a website for Old Connecticut Path. Um, how many of you know about it have been there? The video? video? How many of you have been to the website? I thought you were going to say Okay. All right. So that makes it easier, I can help. Uh, and I've been trying to tell, there's a part of the story that I haven't been able to figure out how to tell on a website or on video. so. Uh, with your forbearance, I'll try and tell it tonight. Maybe I'll get enough of it down so uh, it'll fit together with what's already there. Uh, let me see if I can make this up. And I'm in Wyndham County, and, and I, one of the things I found out is that there's more than one historic trail coming through Wyndham County, that you have the Rochambeau Trail, Washington Trail down the hill here. Uh, you have uh, Route 6 is, is likely, given the settlements along the way here, we have another historic trail. Uh, we have uh, what I've called the Providence uh, Windsor Trail that uh, in 1642 I found out another one of my ancestors went up to uh, Nathaniel Woodward of uh, the Woodward and Safry Survey, which, you know, I, I've come to the conclusion that it's okay to say that it is an ancestor even though it cost 175 th 75 years of uh, warfare between Connecticut and Massachusetts. <laughs> and probably half of uh, Wyndham County would still be in Massachusetts uh, if the decisions hadn't gone the other way. So uh, that's either good or bad. It's uh, the way history would have worked out. Uh, the uh, middle post road that came on down through Putnam uh, was built on an early uh, native trail. And the one I've been tracking is the old Connecticut path. So going on up from the south end of the county on up through to the north end, uh, a lot of folks have come across Wyndham County in the early years of the settlement of Connecticut. But the parties that came along that I'm interested in that uh, reflect my family history, uh, and as I said, I've come to reflect, uh, I realize I had so many relatives uh, and ancestors that came along there, and a whole bunch of others that I'm finding out that people care about that went down to settle Hartford and Windsor and Weathersfield uh, in that time period in the mid 1630s. Uh, as I look back on what I learned about colonial history, there was a great big black hole because uh, when I was in school, you kind of learned about the Pilgrims and Plymouth Rock. And then there was all that boring stuff that they always skipped over, and the next thing you were doing was uh, Lexington and Concord. And that's when America really began. You know, we had Thanksgiving, and we had Lexington and Concord, and then they might have jumped to the Civil War, and then there was a lot of yucky stuff, and it got up to about World War II. And that was the end of the year, so you can find <laughs> Uh, but what I've learned is that there's a whole lot of history that happened between the first arrivals in the 1620s and 1630s uh, and uh, the start, the so-called start of the American Revolution. Uh, and a large part of what I've been interested in, I'm a direct descendant of Thomas Hooker. Uh, and so that's my Hooker connection here, and I understand now that Hartford probably has a Hooker Day and a Hooker Parade. Uh, and uh, they have hooker beer, which I've had, and it's quite good. So, But uh, a central figure in an early history, in the founding of Hartford, and the founding of Connecticut, and a whole lot of other things that went on, uh, goes back to Thomas Hooker. But he didn't come alone. He came with his family, and this is where my family connection comes in, uh, that he and his wife, Susanna, came over uh, with their family. And when they came over in 1633, they had uh, five children. And uh, my ancestor is Mary Hooker, uh, who's the daughter. And uh, she wound up marrying uh, Roger Newton, who came over in 1638. Uh, he enrolled in Cambridge in 1636, left there, come over, and studied for the ministry at uh, what became Harvard. It's amazing what a little bit of money donated and get your name on a university if you get in early enough. 
uh, that John Harvard, uh, his legacy is that his name is now known around the world, at least his last name. Uh, so he came over to study for the ministry, and the story is that he met Thomas Hooker and uh, uh, was invited to study for the ministry or prepare for the ministry in his home down in Crown. So I went down there in 1640, and as they say, the rest is history. Uh, the family business was ministry. Uh, all the children, I went through this, and all the children wound up being ministers or married to ministers. Uh, so it was the family business, and I think there was a little bit of uh, screening. Mary was uh, 16 at the time that, Tom, uh, that Roger came in the household, and uh, uh, I think at that point, 16 was getting kind of old for getting married. Uh, that uh, I suspect that there was a little bit of family involvement since uh, Mary's older sister, Joanna, married uh, uh, Thomas Shepherd, who was the second minister in Cambridge in Newtown. And so she was living up across the street from Harvard, and her husband was the minister of the church where everyone from Harvard went. So I think that there might have been a little selection going on and interviewing potential uh, spouses for, uh, for a younger sister, Mary. So I do have a family connection, and as I said, I found a whole bunch of other family. It's like any one of us, uh, if you go back far enough, we're all related. Uh, they came over, and this is part of the thing that's really remarkable, and it's part of the story before the story of coming down the old Connecticut path, is that they came over in 1633 on a ship, and this is the uh, Mayflower, as an example, but very much like that, as part of what's been, come to be known as the Great Migration. And between 1630 and 1640, 30,000 or more people came over from England on ships, 100 or 200 at a time in each of these ships. And if you can imagine spending two months below deck, uh, they came in the summer, but God forbid if uh, those poor people who happened to get a winter passage on the North Atlantic two months below deck <laughs> must have been just terrible. Although doing math, uh, I found that uh, the youngest child, Samuel Hooker of Thomas and Susanna, the birth date seemed to be in November of 1633. And doing the math, since they arrived in Boston in September of 1633, I think that Susanna had a rough passage too. <laughs> so they were among a large group that came over from England during that time. And within three years, they were a group there were other groups that came before them and after to settle in Windsor and in Wethersfield and a few advanced parties down to Hartford. But it was recorded by Governor Winthrop uh, in his diary, in his journal, that uh, Thomas Hooker and most of his congregation went off to Connecticut uh, driving 160 cows. So you know that by that point the trail was well marked for anyone else that was following. Uh, that uh, the story was that they drank the milk of the cows along the way, and that's what sustained them, which is hard for me to believe, because you know, that much raw milk would probably make travel difficult for them. But uh, what it does tell us is that they probably were doing about 10 miles a day on foot. There were no bridges. This was not at a time when there was a highway. So it was slow going and carrying their belongings, um, sleeping on the ground. Uh, no real accommodations for them. Uh, it was a pretty tough walk. But they made it safely along with other parties that traveled down this route. And at that time, as I said, uh, it took two weeks about for them to go across from Cambridge and Boston. Uh, there were other parties, uh, John Wareham and uh, parties from the Dorchester uh, group went on down to uh, Windsor. Uh, and other parties coming out of Watertown went on down to Wethersfield. It's likely they all were following the same route. So this map that I have, you're not going to be able to see, but uh, uh, things were not well known on the interior. Uh, in Massachusetts Bay, uh, about the boundary of civilized world at that point was around where Route 128 runs. Uh, for those of us, I live in Massachusetts, my wife Dale, you know, we both live in Massachusetts, we've driven down. Uh, we think that uh, that sense of the wilderness still persists, that anything beyond Route 128 is just... <laughs> It doesn't count. But they were really going into the wilderness at that point. And this was an area that was primarily it was native Indian territory. And the natives, uh, I learned a lot about the natives and their intelligence and uh, the relations that they had with those early settlers and travelers. And there, were, there was much more good than bad. There was bad, 
but much more good. And those who traveled the path largely were able to travel without any harm from the natives. And in fact, they did trading with the natives along the way. Uh, and going back a little further, uh, you know, in 1630, one of the chiefs came up from the Hartford area and said, come on down to settle in the Connecticut Valley and uh, uh, probably live to regret it. But that's another story. <laughs> And one of the things that as we get into this is that there wasn't just one super highway going down through. Uh, the natives actually had whole networks of trails and paths that they knew. Uh, and uh, again, they probably in 2020 hindsight might have been better off not showing the English settlers coming in the best ways to travel. Uh, they might have been better off making it hard for travelers to come across because then they might have turned around and gone back home to where they came from. But uh, they did show them a way to get to Connecticut that met their needs and uh, worked within a whole network of trails. So in the task of figuring out how did they do it, uh, it presented some challenges because there's some variations on how they would have gotten here. Uh, and that led to some visions, if you all see pictures of, uh, after the fact, of uh, artists rendering on the journey. We have uh, two ends of the spectrum. You have the trackless wilderness uh, and governor, governor of Massachusetts, Thomas Hutchinson, uh, like a hundred years later, was describing this in his history, saying, they set out with compass in hand through the trackless wilderness and wandered for two weeks. Uh, which, again, the natives probably should have done if they knew what was in their best interest, but they were much more generous than that. They didn't let them get lost in the wilderness. And the other is that it was just a walk in the park. Uh, that, you know, it was a good time and it was all easy. Uh, and we get this kind of Hudson River artist view of the world that it, it, it's really a beautiful thing. Uh, the reality was somewhere in the middle. You know, that uh, the landscape, uh, in some ways the woods were described as park-like by those early English uh, settlers that arrived because the natives burned the woodland. So all the underbrush was gone, so you could actually walk through the woods. Uh, and with a mixed hardwood forest like we have here in this part of the country, you can have pretty comfortable walking conditions if you go to the right places. But in looking at, I'm learning, I'm not a native of Connecticut, even though I've got these connections, that the state seal I'm looking at, it's got the three vines on there, the he who was transplanted still sustains. Well, uh, one, one version of that is the three vines represent those three towns of Weathersfield, Windsor, and Hartford, and the people who traveled to settle there in those first years, in 1633 to 1636. Uh, and so the story that I'm trying to get to is how this connects to the bigger story of America, because I have come to see that this connects to my family, and I found in doing this, I started out with Thomas Hooker, and then his family, and then my other ancestor, Roger Newton, figured they went down, and I found out I have like 10 families that I connect with for founding of Windsor. And one family, at least right now, for Weathersfield, and four for um, Hartford. And there were a whole bunch of other families, and I'm hearing from some of those other families I shared out with you in a couple of minutes here. So it really was a family venture. Uh, at that time, in that great migration, it wasn't individuals coming over and sending for the family later. It was the family came. And within a very short time after their arrival in Boston and in the bay there, um, within, say, two to three years, they were packing the family up and doing this walk through the wilderness to start their new life uh, down in the Connecticut Valley. <coughs> Which really led me to wonder, you know, why would you leave England, spend two months at sea, two weeks walking through the wilderness, uh, and really having to start from scratch again. And I went back to the story of Thomas Hooker, and there were two, there was Thomas Hooker as an important influence. Uh, and when he was in England, uh, Thomas had uh, opposition. And the story was he was an outcast. And I tried to figure out, well, what was he cast out from? Uh, and it turns out he was more like an escapee, but uh, he was trying to get out of his life. And the opposition that he had was in the person, William Laud, who was a bishop and then became the Archbishop of Canterbury. And in England, Archbishop of Canterbury is sort of like the Pope of England. Uh, the only one that's higher in the church is the king. But Laud, as a bishop, uh, 
set out to silence any dissenters from the Church of England uh, who held a different view. And uh, Tom Slicker and the Puritans were, as a group, uh, not conforming with the English Church. And one of the positions that uh, I think in finding this stuff out about Tom Slicker was uh, one of the positions that he had and, and actually was shared by a number of the other ministers uh, was that the congregation had the power to select their minister. And that ran right against the power of the church, which was the power of the king, because the bishop appointed the ministers, and the king had a lot to do with appointing the bishop. So there was a real power struggle in maintaining that degree of conformity. And Wad silenced or removed Thomas Hooker from his position in Chelmsford in England. Uh, he was a lecturer. Uh, he went to Little Vega, which is outside of Chelmsford, and I hope you go there. On our trip to England, I promised my wife, of course she promises, we breeze that we'll go. We're looking to go to England. And he opened a school there uh, in the country. It's about at the Cuckoo Farm. Uh, and uh, his assistant was John Elliott, which is another of those uh, ministers who came to America in 1630 and became the apostle for the Indians, who translated the Bible to Algonquin and established the praying villages and churches, uh, running down what I, is the old Connecticut path. But he was his assistant. Uh, and uh, he said when, you know, it's quoted, when he went to live in the Hooker's home, he said, I never knew what love a family could have until I went to live with the Hooker family. Which is a nice thing to learn. You know, we think of Puritans as these very straight-laced, hard people. Uh, but that wasn't the case at all. And while he, Thomas was there, he had regular meetings with other ministers. He had like 40 or 50 ministers, and they'd come and they'd meet. Uh, and you can imagine if you hold a view about contrary to the Church of England, and you're having a bunch of ministers meet. Uh, Laud, Bishop Laud, didn't like that either, and he set out a warrant for Thomas Hooker, and uh, 49 of the ministers signed a petition, which, putting your name on a petition to Bishop Laud to uh, relieve uh, the charges against Thomas Hooker, was an act of courage. But uh, ultimately, he had to flee. Uh, he wound up being, and I found this out recently, he was in a town called Toaster. Uh, and while he was there in 1630, John Stone, he was in John Stone's home, he was another one of the founders of Hartford, and was uh, Hooker's assistant. Uh, the police came to arrest Thomas Hooker. And Hooker was in the house, but uh, John Stone said, oh, you just missed him. <laughs> he, he was here an hour ago, but maybe if you go that way. So now why would a minister lie to the police to protect another minister from a bishop? And that's where I get down to the story of what this bishop was really doing, that those who were non-conforming and he had issues with, he was using his power as an appointee of the king, and he took that very seriously, uh, drawing people into uh, being arrested. Uh, if they did not uh, renounce their views, uh, there were ministers that their ears were trimmed and their cheeks were branded. Uh, yeah. Uh, S.L. Sacrilegious libeler. So S L on your cheeks. Wow. So you can see that you know the other ministers were saying, get out of the country. And in 1633, Watt became Archbishop of Canterbury, and a whole bunch of uh, Puritan ministers left, and a number of them came over on the same ship with Thomas Hooker. So we can see that you know, during that period, uh, it was right before the English Civil War, it was a war that broke out in the 1640s. And uh, William Laud was among those who literally lost his head. He was executed, along with the king. The king Charles lost his head during the revolution. Uh, there was a lot to pay for after the fact, but it was a bitter time in England, and many people came here to really establish a new England. That leads me down to the story here that, you know, you have these license plates here in Connecticut uh, that you say you're the Constitution State. And uh, Thomas Hooker and those in uh, Hartford, Weathersfield, and Windsor convened the convention in uh, uh, 1638. And Thomas Hooker was the lead-off speaker in a sermon which 
was Walcott that wrote it down. They used to take sermons really serious. I know we go to church and it's kind of they took it very seriously and they actually write notes and Walcott wrote notes. And among those things that Hooker said was that uh, the foundation of authority is laid uh, in the free consent of the people. And he taken that thing that he was persecuted for in England, that the congregation can appoint, has the power to appoint their minister, got transmuted to be the people endow the government with its power. And there was much debate among the members of the, the free men of the three towns. But in January 14, 1639, which is a day I now know that I can remember, because it's also have January 14, but also happens to be my birthday, but it wasn't 1639. <laughs> uh, the free men of the three towns voted. And I found out they voted in secret because they were afraid that their king would uh, punch them, seek them out and arrest them for what they were voting for. They voted to affirm the fundamental orders of Connecticut. And what did that document do? It established certain rights, but what it really did that was so different was that all of the other colonies had charters that established the government of the colony. And the power to run and govern the colony was conferred by the king. In Connecticut, these three communities together said, we as the people can confer and establish a government for us without the need for the consent of anyone outside of our group and our community and without the king. So I'd submit to you in that great black hole of colonial history we think the American Revolution really began with the Declaration of Independence and Lexington and Concord. And submit to you that it happened by those people who traveled from Cambridge and Watertown and from Dorchester, who spent two months at sea coming to Massachusetts and two weeks traveling that wilderness on a trail, established something that had never been done here or anywhere else before. But they established a government that 150 years later, uh, we all know the document that came with it then that starts with the three words, we the people. So there's a line of heritage that goes there. And I've been trying to figure out how to tell this story because it's not just about families and travel. It's that they did something so extraordinary that we should tell the stories about that. And when I looked around, the people weren't, I didn't find that there was much on telling this story. So. I rushed in and said, well, I'll volunteer and see if I can figure out how to tell. This is where I do the salad. I feel like this, the guy who sold the salad mastery. And then, and one more thing. <laughs> uh, that Thomas Hooker was very much involved. He, he didn't just come down to Connecticut and then sit here. He was back and forth on a pretty regular basis, back and forth to Boston and to Providence. Uh, he knew, everybody knew everybody. You start reading about this, it was like, they were, all knew each other. And uh, early on, in 1643, they established, uh, with his instigation as part of the, the instigation that was going on, uh, the New England Confederation for the cooperation in defense and other uh, essential needs between the colonies of uh, Massachusetts, Plymouth, uh, Connecticut, the Connecticut colony, and New Haven. And confederation didn't really work too well. It was an experiment. It got to be much more important in the King Philip War. But if we look ahead again, after the American Revolution, our country, the 13 colonies, for a period of time, formed a confederation. And in actuality, the Continental Congress and the efforts there was, in a way, a confederation. But the first confederation was here. And Connecticut folks and Thomas Hooker and those folks who came down at that time were important parts of establishing that. Again, setting the seeds in place. And uh, you know, I look today and we say, you know, when you look at the Middle East and the Arab Spring, and you know, we think that democracy should just happen. Well, it didn't just happen here. Uh, there was experimenting, but it started. We can see some places that it started. Boy, 
I gotta go faster because I've got only about 10 minutes. All right. Because you all went to the website, you know that I've been trying to trace thing, this thing down. And I feel like I wasn't able to really tell that part of the story at the beginning there about why is this so, you know, I'd say well, such an important part of our national heritage that these people went down this path, they established a new government, they established a, a way of governments working together. Uh, they had lots of children, they were very prolific, which is another thing that we think Puritans call uh, sexual mores. Well, they certainly had children and they procreated in large numbers. And those children uh, spread all across the country. You know, my family's an indication they all traveled west, north, and all over the country. And they were part of the American expansion. So I went out to look and see if I could find the trail, reconstruct it, and if there was anything left that we could share. And I thought it'd be easy. There are a lot of signs if you go out across Massachusetts. And I, but there actually are a lot of monuments that it was an important thing to commemorate. Uh, all across Massachusetts. Massachusetts really did a lot, and Connecticut has a few. Uh, that uh, we have some indication of about the likely route from John Elliott and his uh, uh, praying villages that he established. And in looking at this, I tried to understand how would they do it in a way that was safe, was reasonably direct, uh, was walkable. You know, we're all used to hopping in the car and you know, try translating that back if you had to walk. Uh, that they needed good resting places and uh, good places to do tr you know, have trade with the natives. And there are some other considerations which I think I'll just share real quickly. The biggest one uh, that I saw was river crossings. Since they didn't have any bridges, it was critically important to have the right time to travel in the right place. And, oops, boy, what's going on? One of the best places, and I show this, and again, it's in the uh, series of videos, was looking at the Quinnebog River right up the, the road here. Uh, that uh, the conditions that show shallow water, low banks, you can walk right across. Uh, the Willimantic River last year after Irene uh, is a raging torrent. You wouldn't want to go near it. I mean, you want to stay well back from the banks. If you fall in, you're gone. So that was a real concern. And another one that related to this was that it tended to be what I was seeing up on the high hills. And I, in December, we had a meeting over in Ashford at Warren, you know, the town hall. And I took some pictures, and you may not be able to see it. From the bridge on Route 44, you got a pretty good sized stream on Mount Hope River. You go three miles up to Oaks Road, it's more like a brook. Uh, the waters run on pretty fast off the hills. If you want a good place to travel, go up on the hills. Uh, the B&B, beavers and bio, or bio and beavers said that the Puritans and the Pilgrims uh, wouldn't have made it without the beaver. They needed the Bible for their faith, but the beavers would sustain them economically. Uh, and it also had a big effect on where they traveled, because uh, those of you who walked all around the uh, Wyndham County know uh, the beavers are out there, and they used to be out there almost everywhere. Uh, and the fur trade, uh, which sustained the Puritans and the Pilgrims, uh, pretty much eradicated the beavers in this part of the country. Although now with the laws the way they are, they are on rebound. But the effect that they have is that they really change the landscape, and it makes it difficult to find places to travel. You have to work around them. And one of the things, the other thing is that during this period of time, it was really, and we talk about global warming now, they had global cooling to such a degree that in Europe, uh, the glaciers and the Alps were coming down and wiping out towns. They're coming off the mountains. Uh, there was uh, famine uh, because of the cold the crops. There were summers without, there were years without summer. And that affects here in the travel during that period in the 1600s, uh, that there'd be certain windows that you'd be able to travel. And what I found also for solar is that you come on the south side of the hills. And the trails, you find it, and it's, it's like, okay, there it is. And the last one that you're well aware of is storms. Uh, in 1635, they had a hurricane that came up uh, that uh, historically was like the hurricane in 1938 here in Connecticut, uh, devastating. But they didn't have any warnings. You know, not that we had much better, but you know, ours is way better than what they had. It was just boom, it was there. Uh, and you can see these streams here uh, would really be affected. I'm going to go real quick because there were a couple people. John Winthrop walked to Connecticut. He has a great story. There's a great story that he wrote in his journal about his travels. Part of the way he came down the Connecticut path about to, I think, Thompson, and then took a wrong turn. Uh, wound up traveling, he was going to uh, New London, 
Uh, he wound up traveling to Springfield, to New Windsor, to Hartford, to St. Brook, and then back to New London. But he played, he was a later governor of uh, Connecticut for you know, multiple terms. Uh, those of you who haven't seen it, a real gem is on the market. It's a uh, map of ancient Wyndham County, and it's on the website. So you can go and look at it. It's like, wow, it's like a treasure map. And it was helpful in trying to figure out where the path went and how it came across uh, Wyndham County. And uh, there were others who collected the stories of the people in the towns uh, and shared them. And one of them in Woodstock was Lloyd Williams and at the Woodstock Historical Society, using the descriptions that he collected uh, from those who remembered the oral history that was passed down of where the path went. Uh, it was possible to uh, try to recreate the route right across the Woodstock. You know, Woodstock's a huge town. It was a, kind of a nightmare to figure it out. Uh, a big part of coming across the rest of Wyndham County is credited to uh, the Chisholm brothers of Ashford, who drew a map, David Chisholm drew a map, and his brother Charles did a description of here landmarks. And when I went out the field, checked it, it followed pretty true. It's out there. Uh, and these guys, again, Woodward and Zachary, uh, they came across in 1642, uh, cost 175 years of conflict by their survey. Uh, but as you look at the data, it's interesting now what we can do with the data when we look at you know, mapping software and use their coordinates and see where they thought they were versus where they actually were, and that they were doing it with the uh, chain measures and uh, doing uh, sightings on the sun at noon to figure out and calculate what latitude they were at. And you go, well, no wonder that there was conflict because they just didn't have the technology to do what they were being asked to do. But that trail runs really right along uh, Route 101. 44 and Route 74 on up towards uh, Windsor, so it's right across uh, Windham County. And a whole bunch of the Indian trails that uh, are connected, and uh, again, are on the website. I to do this quickly here. Uh, last thing, I did go out, and I wish you could see this because I don't have a dowsing stick. I wish I did. Or some special divination to be able to find these things. Uh, with a GPS, you know, GPS, you come out and you look. Even if you have maps, you go out and you look and you say, what's there? What traces can you find? And just between Crystal Pond and Ligolo River, there's probably a couple hundred GPS points. Of, you say, well, gee, what was he thinking? Well, it's not that easy to establish something uh, without going out and looking. But I can say, I did find what I think is the path. What I found is a path where it looks fairly continuous. Uh, I started in this section up in Sutton, at uh, West Sutton, at Waters Farm, and coming across the Douglas Woods, across Webster and Dudley, uh, Thompson, beautiful stretches along in Thompson, uh, the known stretches across Woodstock, and then a really, what looked to be a fairly continuous route across Eastford and Ashford, and then on further, we don't have anyone from, no one from Willington here, okay. I took some liberties to get through Wellington, but it worked. And uh, most recently, pieces in Holland. Mm -hmm. And we're looking to continue this on into Hartford, and to Windsor, and to Weathersfield. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are common attractions. Uh, we had a meeting, thanks to uh, Ruth and Steve, we had a meeting back at the beginning of December over in Ashford County. We had a group, there was about 20, 25 folks who showed up, which is a real great turnout on our a week morning at about 11 o'clock. So, you know, it was like, let's have a discussion. There were a number of things that came out in the discussion after talking about the history of the route of the path that really come back to uh, preservation, um, conservation, uh, making the path more accessible. Uh, there are some wonderful places that uh, I call the pearls of the path that are public access available now. And there's some extraordinary stretches that are in between those, which uh, those of you who are involved in conservation commissions or historical societies, uh, community organizations, uh, to really take a look and talk with those groups about ways that, you know, I say do no harm. If you don't want to do anything, the landowners, and the landowners have been great. Most of the land is open that I've walked. A very limited amount of space has been posted, and I have to work around it. Um, to be able to preserve the land, if nothing else for folks to be aware that they have a corridor through which uh, people traveled 
who played in such an important part in Connecticut history and the history of our country. If possible, and uh, folks are generous in their sharing, um, working with the historical societies like Woodstock has done, where they run things like on October, they actually have guided walks across the landowner's property to show and share that. Uh, other possibilities include, uh, I know, the blue, the Connecticut Forestry Parks, the blue trails. Uh, this is a, an extraordinary wilderness, and one of the best. I think if, if you were to ask, it's a, could you take the group and show them 10 miles of the trail and have them get a sense of what it was like, I know just where it takes uh, up in Eastford at Camp Mahaco, we'd start there and we'd walk across. It's a big low river, the brook, looks like a river. Uh, we'd walk across uh, the Nipmuc Forest on the Nipmuc Trail, there's a portion that's right along the path. Uh, we'd do a little work around because there are parts that can be difficult to you know, get across uh, with property owners, uh, but still get across over uh, Westford Hill down to Wellington and Taylor Pond. Uh, and uh, Ruby, or Fenton Ruby. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary experience. And you have to go there to have a sense of what you got. Uh, one of the things that I noticed, I just did a section of the path in Holland uh, that's located, one side is located by 84, uh, bounded by 84, the other by Route 74. Uh, you can imagine the sound level. Beautifully preserved, right there in the woods. Compare that to walking. Uh, we were just out, Dale and I were just out at uh, Fenton Ruby. The quiet. And up through Eastford and across the route. When, uh, in December, we went up with uh, Nick Valentoni up to uh, Walker Road in Eastford. And I did a video on that. So if you want to do it, and, and thanks to Steve, uh, he found that the Walker Road is a public access road. So that uh, you can walk there without, you know, going over a private land owner's property. Uh, and it's an extraordinary place. So I guess what I, I want to close with, since you're all conservation-minded, is that you have something that's extraordinary. Uh, it's so close. I don't know why all those folks go up 84 and think they got to go to uh, Maine, New Hampshire. Those are nice places. <laughs> something so extraordinary they have to go a long way to find anything to match and it's right here. And I want to share with you that uh, um, last week uh, the New England Historic Genealogy Society published an article on their weekly newsletter that I've written about the work on the old Connecticut path. They have uh, like 65,000 members nationally. Uh, um, in the 10 day, or you know, that was last Wednesday, so this is Thursday, so eight days, that it's been out. Uh, there have been over 6,000 new visits to the Old Connecticut Path website. Almost 12,000 web pages, like 3,000 viewings of videos. It's gotten a flood of emails from folks all across the country. And the thing that keeps coming back is their family goes back to those families who came across the, the ocean who walked the two weeks, who were part of establishing the fundamental orders. There's a deep personal connection. And I even had folks, I had responses over back from a couple of folks in England. There's a huge interest in the England Historic Genealogy Society would like to work with some organizations and being able to share. Because their members, wanted, they're, they, in April they have members coming down to Hartford um, to the Connecticut Library of Historical Society. They want to be able to share these things. So, um, you have something that's extraordinary. Uh, I've been so fortunate, and thanks to the support of my wife, and most tolerant of these little rambles. <laughs> what have you been up to this time? Uh, to be able to find something that I believe that is truly extraordinary and worthy of your taking pride in, and looking at ways that you can share this uh, and welcome people to come and experience it. The original intent of the December 3rd meeting was really to just spark the interest and see who, who was aware of the trail because Steve had sent me this email and Steve has the Connecticut Path going right by his house. And I have
probably a good portion of it going by my house. Um, so, of course, there was interest. But also, in the past, so many of us have been involved in linkages between spaces, you know, and this is a superb linkage between both open spaces, um, people, and our heritage, that it's a, it's a huge possibility. And if we can keep the energy going, you know, it, it started with the book, and then, you know, Jason showed up with the videos, and it, it just has this wonderful layer, which which it has the ability to bring in so many different types of people, the hiking people, the open space people, the cultural people, even going back to things like the Charter Oak, which was, you know, part of the Connecticut Charter, which came off the time of Spoker's work, etc. I mean, there's just layers and layers of possibilities. And I think we need to be not so dogmatic about where the actual trail is, because like any trail, there are going to be blockages. But if you know how, for instance, the original Nipmuc Trail was formed, Sam Dodd started on Putin Lane in Mansfield. And he went to his neighbor and he said, you know, I got a mile of trail behind me. And then he went to the next neighbor and said, you know, I got two miles of trails. And he probably got blocked here and there, so he made a detour and he got three miles of trail. And then he got to Yale Forest. They said, no way. <laughs> and Connecticut Forest and Park went to to the state legislature and said we need a land over liability clause so we can continue our trails through private property with no liability. So when you get this about, you know, there's a liability if somebody walks, they're protected as long as you're not charging or you don't have a cistern with a broken top that they can walk through, you know, little things. But, um, so those are, those are things to keep trails going. And trails cannot be just the Connecticut Trail, it links to the Nipmuc Trail, which in turn links to Goodwin through the Airline Trail. So there's these huge possibilities. And if we look in our towns and we do our mapping, we can find those possibilities and we can link things together. And it may be that we end up with three feet of trail, like maybe where portions of the Nipmuc scoot around somebody's house and then they broaden open into an open space, a protected open space. So think in terms of people and how many layers of people you can get involved and where you can run this trail. And if you're not too dogmatic, we can still keep the experience of the Connecticut Trail and portions of it, but maybe not all of it. But it's certainly worth the possibility. And, you know, right now Connecticut is everything about being revolutionary. So this is really kicks into the whole tourist part of Connecticut, etc. So I think it's the most ripe time we can have with the interest that Jason's created, you know, and from our own conservation commissions. And the December 3rd meeting was really trying to find out how we could move forward. Steve has started in his own town. He's got his, you can tell a little bit about what you're doing in your town. Well, our, our conservation commission is interested in pursuing this. We've uh, invited Jason to come and give a presentation in March. We wanted to do it in the evening after uh, daylight savings um, because actually we're co-sponsoring this with our senior group and um, they thought that maybe th there are folks in town that have old stories, verbal stories that have been passed down from generation to generation that could probably share more information about the root of the old Connecticut path that don't like to come out after dark anymore. <laughs> so we're, we're, uh, we're, we're putting, we put this off until late March after daylight savings but uh, I think um, this little panel in the upper left of Jason's handout is, is something that came out of that December 3rd meeting that Ruth organized, and it, to me it looks like a nice blueprint um, to, to pursue um, doing some concrete things that would make sure that this treasure is not lost um, to the next generation. And so that's uh, the Conservation Commission and the Historical Society in Eastford. And, at this point, the Library Board, the Historical Society, the Senior Group, and the Conservation Commission are all co-sponsoring this program in March. And what time is that? Eastern. And, uh, and my hope is that that will be an impetus to them. Go out and find the areas that are already on public lands and publicly accessible. Begin to talk about marking those in some way so with some kind of signage so that people know what they're on. And then someone made the analogy of him and Jason of pearls on a necklace, you know. The pearls are there that we can already access, and some of them are beautiful spots that Jason's uncovered. And then down the road, how do we connect those pearls into a necklace? So we're, 
we're going to look to go down that road in the town of Eastford. And Ashford has some wonderful spots uh, as well in the Nipmuc Forest and elsewhere. So I think it's definitely doable. And it would be a crime, really, because Jason has done so much of the legwork. <laughs> Not to take it up and with it at this point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another of the possibilities, and, and again, going back, I have to give credit to the folks over in Woodstock and the Historical Society, because they were kind enough to have me come down a year ago and share just a PowerPoint. And I said, I can't tell this story this way after I spent a whole lot of time showing a lot of slides. Uh, and at that point, they were talking about their October walk, which I did go on after. And what I think I set out to do with these little videos is really create something like a virtual October. That folks, that you don't have to be here in Connecticut, in Wyndham County to take the walk. Uh, and there's been a response to that, but uh, uh, Walktober and the last Green Valleys. Uh, I think that, you know, in each town, uh, if next October there was a, a guided walk on a portion to introduce folks to, here's what's in your town. Mm -hmm. See, you know, it's kind of, you have to go through awareness, which is kind of like, what we're doing now. And then get out there and look and say, okay, well now what can we do with it? Uh, but that certainly would be a wonderful way to get more people to actually have a direct experience. Um, you can't, it's so striking when you're down uh, at the bottom of the Nipmuc Trail on the brook there, uh, and you listen and you just hear birds in the wind. Uh, you don't realize how quiet the world is uh, until a plane comes over and ruins it for you. But uh, it's something that's very special, and I think that people are looking for those opportunities. I think Steve, just one second ago, just when Steve said something really important, Jason, I think he's alluded to it too. The story is so powerful, but it's also the next generation and the next generation who repeats the story that they heard from their father. And if Steve had a walk on his property and the neighbor who knew about that stood on the side and said, I remember my father saying this, it validates what's being said. And it also brings in a layer of people, their friends and other friends, who believe that validation and the fact that this is important. And I think you, the more people you bring in, the less opposition you'll have maybe in the future for protection or, you know, it, it's, it's bringing in those layers of, of different interests and those older folks who will validate those things for you. And validation is huge. <laughs> For more information, visit the Old Connecticut Path website 